Prayer, Harvest Song, and Bona and Paul from Kane by Gene Toomer today. Bona? Bona? How do you say that one? I said it Bona. <laughs> Bona? I get yeah. Bona sounds more feminine. Yeah. Let us know in the comments the right way to say it. Now let's start off with prayer. Snuck assumption here. If you haven't noticed by now, Gene Toomer, obviously not a materialist. We said that in the last set of poems here. But here we kind of have, you know, the three pieces, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, if you will, body, mind, and spirit. This one I think is very straightforward. Even uh, a simpleton like myself with poetry kind of got this one. Uh, that's kind of nice, though. It's refreshing that sometimes you're you're reading all these very rich text poems and you're trying to pull out all these little nuggets and then you get one that is almost like brain candy that we've talked about before that's that, that's easier to digest and I definitely enjoyed that aspect of it. Do you think it matters if if we did have three parts if we have a mind and the mind has desires if we have a soul and the soul has needs or desires and obviously the body is going to need desires and such does it matter if the three aren't aligned? Like if your body needs something, but your soul's like, mm, that's not good for you. Like, <laughs> I think we can relate to that because I think there's a lot of times we feel an internal struggle and to kind of externalize it as three separate things, you know, reminds me of that uh, Inside Out movie from Disney where you, you had the different personalities inside the girl's head. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that inside of my head is like that sometimes as well. I mean, we all kind of do, right? And I think that you are totally correct that, Whatever you believe in has to kind of be aligned together because I think of it of like eating food. So my body needs certain foods. My brain wants junk food. I want sodas. I want sweet tarts. I love those, you know, those candies, but my body is going to punish me if I eat those things. So if those aren't aligned together, then there are going to be consequences. One of the things he says in this poem is a closed lid is my soul's flesh eye. It makes me think about, you know, when you set up, when you shut off some of your senses, they talk about how the other senses compensate. And there's even, you know, arguments for why we have phantom limb syndrome, where if you had an arm and you lose that arm for whatever reason, sometimes doing certain things makes, it makes it tingle. Make, you feel like your arm's still there because your brain's using that part of the brain that used to process the input from the arm. What does it mean if you cut off one of those senses, right? Like, if you cut off the, you know, if you think about it from like a Buddhism or like an ascetic perspective of how you cut off pleasures of the world, does that heighten the soul? Does that heighten the mind even potentially? I, you always have certain months <laughs> where people cut and uh, go on these fasts because I think it, it pushes them to experience life perhaps in a different needs perspective. I think there is something to that. If you start to starve your body, you do change the way you think. I think there is merit to that. I think that if you starve your mind, that there could be changes to your body or your soul, your chakra, your chi, whatever you want to call it. And I think that if you cut off maybe your soul, that there could be consequences to your body and mind. I think that whatever you believe, there has to be balance, unity. And I think that that's what I kind of see in this poem is balance. So in terms of needing something, that kind of transitions us into Harvest Song. Uh, you know, it's the last poem in the collection, believe it or not. And if we think about the little pictures throughout this, you'll notice at the beginning, it was just kind of like the third of a moon, the two thirds of a moon. And now we have a complete circle when we enter Cabinus, the third section. So the idea of a moon and the imagery of a moon has constantly appeared through this. And a moon is a circle. Right, you, you end up where you start in terms of, you know, the snake that eats itself. So if you recall, the first poems in this was now the first poem, the set of poems, the first poem was called Reapers. Reapers. Yeah. And here you have the ending of this collection with a man who we believe used to be a reaper. And he longs to be back with the other Reapers, I think. I mean, how, how would you take what he longed for? Yeah, this one was difficult. I did see the cyclical nature of the, the, the poems coming to fruition here, which is kind of cool. What is the Reaper trying to harvest? Is it something referencing to the South with harvesting? I didn't know if it was something that was a literal harvest like farming. Is it the, the worth or the soul of a man to kind of connect back to our prayer? I wasn't sure exactly, but I felt when I was reading it that this was something that is a hunger for more. I think Toomer 
spoke to me of I, I need to move forward. I need more that I, I can't be static and become like caked and rotted that if if I continue feeding myself in all different aspects, I'm I'm not going to fall into the plight of the reapers, of, of death perhaps. And then whatever death of the mind, death of the body, or death of the soul. Did you get a sense of the end is near? Like this man is at retirement, end of his life type of situation. And perhaps what he you said earlier was that he hungers for more. Did he not get satisfied with the life that he lived? Oh, that's really sad. I never thought about it in the aspect of that this is regret. Oh, oh, <laughs> I was trying to be so positive on this one. I mean, because that my, immediately I went to, you know, harvesting you're you're cutting down you're killing the plants harvest time uh, moving into winter death reapers death ah oh. i got a sense of you know the end of the days i got a sense of you know why is he lonely is it because all of the others you know passed away you know being the last survivor isn't necessarily all it's cracked up to be and i think that even if it was a hard life it is, you know, the value of labor, of, of laboring with someone, working hard on something with someone. I think we all have a certain bond or connection with that. And for this man to potentially no longer have those bonds, like all those other people have moved on, you know, and he's looking back on, you know, was it worth it? Is he's questioning his value and did he enjoy his life even? Uh, if he was satisfied, I, I don't think he would hunger. So there's there's something that was either wrong about his assumptions or perhaps it's that he hungers for the end so that he can join his friends again, because we do have a heavy Christian influence in the writing here at the end as we move towards, you know, the ending that if if he does believe in the afterlife, that that's, you know, the, there's so many references to the the black savior or redemption that maybe that's what he is seeking at this point in time is his final moment to be redeemed for a life of suffering with others. Oh, I like that. That's nice. That gives a little bit more positive spin to it than what we were talking about a few moments ago. But I also think about this idea of is it is a is a, a hard life worth living without working for someone, your family, and that what I think comes down for a lot of it is you work hard for your family. I mean, probably for yourself as well, but. I, I think about the idea of I I, I harvest and I, I reap what I sow and I do that for my family and that's what reinvigorates me and without that maybe I, I wouldn't want to try as hard and that's what the man seems to be doing. Yeah. So let's move into Bonnet and Paul, which I think is actually one of the stronger prose pieces, at least for me and in, in, in what I got out of it. Now you'll notice that while a lot of the pieces appear to either take place in the earlier parts in Georgia a few later and a lot of the mid parts here in this second cycle is in washington dc i think this is the only one that takes place in chicago now that's why you like it <laughs> well a lot of times when authors do that it makes you say oh okay this isn't a washington dc story right this is this is that great migration story of these cultural hotbeds and where we were fleeing to uh, had a lot more to it it's it's the same image in um it gets cut out a lot. I hate it with the Christmas Carol, right? With Ebenezer Scrooge after Marley and Marley. Is it just two off ghosts? And this is Ebenezer Scrooge's story or does Ebenezer Scrooge look out the window and he sees lots of other people suffering and those other ghosts are what justify this as the human experience. I think this is one of the best pieces of the book so far because it expands even further again. And you weren't expecting that. We, as you mentioned, had this kind of set of standards, and now we see a, a shift. And there's a little bit of tonal shift in this one from the other prose pieces in the book. And I feel like Chicago is maybe a little bit faster pace. Uh, it has, I think, a little bit more upbeat tempo. It was more around, uh, you know, focusing on music and and literature and art. And I think you kind of feel it in the the speed of this story moving forward very very quickly. A lot happens in a, in a short amount of time. Yeah. And we've been, I mean, I wouldn't say subtle about it, but we've been kind of dancing around the female consciousness is now entering more and more into its own, right? With Doris, 
we saw for the first time a female wanting something, having her own kind of like desires, right? And that's something a lot of people question when they read the women of Cain, which is, well, why were these people silenced, right? Why, why, why was there no no interior monologue really from a female perspective? And we saw how in Copper Wire the tape was was taken off, right? They were liberated. And here we again see a woman that is wanting something, and for the first time she's actually so Doris didn't didn't take any steps, right? She cried, ran away, uh, was failed to to do anything about her desires. Here we have Bona, or however you pronounce it, actually trying to play basketball with Paul. Like she tries to guard him, like she's interested, and in, and apparently Paul plays for the Knicks. Man, she she took a shot to the face and went down. <laughs> This is a great part of the story where you see that Bona is doing something that is defying expectations, I think, of the time period, regardless of the race issue of women playing sports was probably a pretty rare thing. So she's putting herself out there trying to prove herself with Paul. That in itself is awesome. And then, you know, she she's not backing down, which is great. Like, she she's there to stay, and he doesn't pull any punches, which I guess is good because it's showing equality in a time period that there was obviously no equality. Mm. Now, this next part, when he goes back to the dorm room, remember, he's kind of like looking out the window. He thinks he sees Georgia, the fields, pro tip. You totally cannot see Georgia from Chicago, at least any place that I've been. Uh, <laughs> but what is he seeing? Is he seeing his past, like in terms of the cane fields, the longing for the South, like of perhaps where his parents might have come from in the Great Migration up north, perhaps even? What what do you think he's longing for or seeing in these fields? I think he is imagining his past. I think he is imagining what his life would be if he wasn't in the big city, had his family still been in the South. What would his life look like? We really don't know if that's something he's longing for if he's missing that or is this something that he 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 he's happy he doesn't have that he he's looking back and he's thinking wow it could be so much worse like my life sucks now but it could be so much worse it could be also part of that fragmentation in terms of the rural versus the city in terms of like the the black and the white you see how paul seems to try to intellectualize it but it's still broken up in different pieces in terms of the fragmentation. And when art comes in and he, he looks in the mirror and he sees like this magnificent thing in front of him and he's got the blonde hair, you know, Paul is well aware of this racial consciousness while art is moving about. He, he doesn't need to worry about race the way that someone who is black living in a city would like, he's almost unaware compared to Paul who is piecing together what is his identity, what is his consciousness. This is probably the highlight of the story for me of when, as a reader, I start to realize that Toomer's really hitting the nail on the head of assimilation into not only uh, white America, but assimilation into urban America, which is a big shift in this time period. Even still today, you have you know small town boy or girl moving to the big city that is a culture shock. The the pace of life, the language, how people treat one another, that's very different. And that tonal shift in here, you can see that this is showing us the history of how our country evolved during this time period of the, the great migration happened, not just in Washington, D.C., and not just in the South, but across our entire country. Yeah. And it even kind of calls out how, well, there's that line that says like the white people, white weren't, white weren't meant for the night. And it kind of goes into why do the white people seclude themselves, right? Like, why do they move in a pack and almost move away from people of color in a sense? And, you know, they're on the double date and she's she's pursuing him. Or is she pursuing the difference she sees on him in a sense, not in him, but he's he's darker skinned. And is that what Bana is attracted to? She's she's just interested in him because he's different. And for me, I kind of took this stance. I'd love to get your thoughts, but I remember one of my good friends in high school, she was actually Asian, and she was being pursued by, by multiple guys. She was a beautiful girl and, and one of the top grades in the class, like a great catch, right? And she told me that one of the guys that was chasing her, he's just like, oh, I love Asian girls. You guys, you guys have that exotic look. 
And I'm like, oh, that's good, right? Like, like he's into you. And she said, yes, Una, but you have to remember, does he see me? Or does he see that I'm Asian? And he has, I want to say an Asian fetish, but he's attracted to that and not the uniqueness of me. He's attracted to my race, not to who I am. And that's always kind of stuck with me to be judged a priori based on how you look is, is, you know, we've talked about racism from, from, you know, the, the violent and the, the separation perspective, but now you have it from an attraction standpoint of just because you're different, that's how you're being judged in a positive light. Oh, I love this conversation. Who I am. That's tough because your friend and maybe other people, they identify themselves not by their race, not by their looks, by their intellect, their humor, their religion, their political stance, whatever. What is it of who I am? Because when I look at somebody and I might be attracted to them, that's literally just my physical attractionness. But all people are different, right? Some people are attracted to humor. Some people are attracted to money. Who I am, that matters. And that's the issue between Bona and Paul here is I don't think they truly know each other. There's no communication going on. And you have one pursuing the other on just a physical merit. And I don't think that necessarily is wrong. That just is has to be communicated that I'm attracted to you because you are something that I have never had or I don't see. That uniqueness is important to me or that uniqueness is something that I want to try or pursue. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the, a, a physical standpoint. In this case, that is. And I think in your friend's case, it was. But I don't think that should be always something associated with a negativity. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. And it's kind of like you have to take that first step and get past that. Right? Like, how do you move past that? And Paul, he he almost has a, like a schism, I feel like because of this, because he is aware of, of how he's different and how he's being pursued because of his difference, right? There, there's a quote in here that says, their stares giving him to himself filled something long empty within him and were like green blades sprouting in his consciousness, right? So so the idea that how, how Tumor plays with like light bouncing off of people's faces and there's the murmurs of, is he Japanese? Is, is he Native American? Like, and they named a bunch of like, like the ethnicities, I don't remember which ones. But it, but it impacts Paul because of his awareness of his differences. And that's, I think, true for all of us, right? We see that Paul is getting his first taste of maybe racism, not necessarily in a positive or negative way. He's just seeing that people that look different are sometimes treated different or are going to be researched different. Like, hey, I don't know you. How what <laughs> you know like and, and they, they need to talk mm -hmm. yeah i imagine that's probably like if you're a sikh and you have you know people always going to ask you about like like oh hey what, what are you wearing on your head right like like that's probably something that they're used to getting some people might get annoyed by it right but it is the first contact and the difference is what they see and that's always going to sprout those questions and for some people that's enough to to create that divide between you and others and and I always wonder when he was leaving and that bouncer was just like, hey, man, you're, what, what did he say? You're going on for great things. It was something positive the bouncer was saying, right? And Bana took off. Like, sh she was gone. And, and what does that mean? Does that mean she wasn't willing to wait to see past the differences? Like, she, she, she professes herself to him, but then takes off when he doesn't instantly reciprocate it. When he didn't give her the response that she wanted... She was not willing to wait and have the patience to work through it with him. But that's how I took it, at least. 100% agree. And I don't know why. I mean, there it could be an age thing. We, we really don't know, I guess, how old they are exactly. Uh, dating is a young person game. Uh, she could be embarrassed. We, we don't know. that She threw herself out there. She put herself in a very vulnerable state and feels rejected. That's got to be tough. And she said, you know what? I tried... The ball is in your court. I'm out of here. Uh, why Why does Paul deserve a second, third, or fourth chance? She, I mean, because I feel like this is almost his second chance, maybe even third. We don't know what happened prior to this story. I, I think that, you know, I, I don't fault Bonna at all for, for leaving because maybe Paul is, is kind of being a jerk. Could be, could be. Up next, we're done with stories now too, technically, because the last one was written as a play, but then adapted into a short story. 
you'll see a lot of these had kind of like play like elements leading into it. But to your point about the prelude, I don't even while we're recording it as triplets, you'll, you'll see some of these themes kind of go over the, the sets and the cycles and stuff like that. So we're entering into the third cycle next. Looking forward to finishing off Kane Strong with Cabness. Steal your hearts. It's an emotional one. My name has <laughs> been Una. Playlist down below. Peace. Peace.